Hey. I got a picture with Nikki Giovanni. And I tweeted it. And it has like 200 retweets already. So give a round of applause for the legendary Nikki Giovanni. Um, She says, weird being old, and I'm sure y'all think it's weird being young. What's really weird is not being young uh, no more, uh, which is where I'm at. And to kind of see the next generation's genius in the same space with a legend is just humbling. And um, very few things indoor. I think that's what you figure out when you're middle-aged. A lot of stuff you're upset about, worried about, a lot of people you're upset and worried about, they just kind of fade away later in life. And very few things endure. Actually, it turns out only two things endure. Uh, great art and the pyramids <laughs> in Africa. I say that because uh, Nikki Giovanni's poetry and her words will probably outlast most of the legislation that we worry about in Washington, D.C. It'll outlast uh, the political and military conflicts that we're talking about. You think about today, people right now on the subway are reading Rumi. On the subway, they're reading Hafiz today. Children right now studying Shakespeare, studying James Baldwin. Uh, great art, which touches the human heart, transcends cultures, transcends time. And that's why, truly, we honor Dr. King. Uh, I think we misunderstand Dr. King. I think we think about him as a theological genius. I think we think about him as a political genius. But we fail to honor him as the artistic genius that he was. Uh, most people are not willing or have not been willing to tell the truth about the, the great speech, the I Have a Dream speech. But I'm going to tell the truth about it. I think it's time for us black folk who know the truth about that speech to tell the truth about that speech. That speech sucked. I'm going to say it again. Because you think I can't say that and not get struck down by lightning. But that speech on paper sucked. Here's a true story. And it's important for young people to understand this. First of all, Dr. King was 24 years old in Montgomery. We talk about Dr. King like he was a thousand years old, don't we? Like he was like 90. He was 24 in Montgomery when the women in that community organized, because it was the women that organized that, and went and snatched his little butt up and threw him in front of the cameras. So if it didn't go right, he could go back home to his daddy. That's what the Montgomery bus boycott was. It was the sisters. And by the way, Rosa Parks' feet didn't get tired. You know, we, we don't tell young people the NAACP at that time was a banned organization. You're hearing the music from South Africa. It was banned. It was illegal. You would go to jail. You'd get killed if you were known to be a member of the NAACP. Now you say, that's the National Association for the Advancement of Certain People. <laughs> so you're not scared of the NAACP. But it was illegal. Where was Rosa Parks the summer before she got arrested? She was in Tennessee being trained by the NAACP as an organizer. She didn't get arrested. She got herself arrested. And then she, they went and got Dr. Martin Luther King's son. It was no Dr. Martin Luther King. It was Dr. Martin Luther King, Daddy King in Atlanta who had a little son who trying to get away from daddy had run up to Montgomery. So that's why they always say Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. See, if the dad was a big deal, he was just a little kid. But when he stepped up to the microphone, 
There was a musicality in his voice. He had been preparing himself from younger than you for what they say, a day such as this. And that artistry you guys are developing, you have no idea, young people, where fate might put you and what microphone fate might put in your hand and whose ear might be listening. And thank God Daddy King's little son approached the, the microphone and when you can, you can hear it even through the scratchy recordings, the beauty of his performance. You can't listen to nobody's speech over and over and over again like you can listen to Dr. King's speech because he's just one step from singing and he had less than an hour to prepare the speech, 24 years old. Fast forward to when he's 33, 33 year old kid standing on the steps of the Washington Monument. Biggest protest in history in the country. Quarter million people, now we do million people, uh, when uh, uh, President Obama got inaugurated, well, we had two million uh, people out there. But at the time, a quarter million people, that was a lot of people. Biggest protest in history. And Dr. King was bombing. How do you know this speech sucked? Nobody can remember the first four-fifths of the speech. Because the first four speech, the first four fifths of the speech was not I have a dream. It was I have a complaint. I have a critique. I have a very long list of issues about which I'm thoroughly pissed off. That was read the speech. He's talking about police brutality. He's talking about getting a, a, a bounce check from America's government. Insufficient funds. Somebody know the speech. Somebody know the whole speech. <laughs> the check came back marked insufficient funds. That's not a happy speech. <laughs> Do I have permission to tell the truth? It was written by a committee the night before. Bayard Rustin them stayed up fighting and, and, and handed him a speech written by a committee the night before. And he was doing the best he could with the speech. But that speech would have been quickly forgotten. But, as usual, Shocking no one, a sister saved the day. Mahalia Jackson, standing three, four rows behind the brother, a true artist, a true genius, watching the crowd, watching the young brother bomb, Lean forward and said very quietly, tell him about your dream, Martin. Tell him about your dream. Why did she say that? Because earlier that summer, she had been with the brother in Detroit. And in Detroit, the brother had given a speech that was kind of aight. It was kind of aight. I mean, best ever in the English language, possibly competing with Churchill, but I think King gets him. Best ever in the English language, but he gave a speech in Detroit that was kind of high. And he got to this point where he was trying to talk about this dream, and it, but Mahalia. Now you can listen to that speech too. I mean, it's all on the internet. The Detroit refrain, the I have a dream refrain in the, the, the Detroit speech falls very flat. Doesn't work. But Mahalia, 
she saw something in that refrain and she just felt maybe he should try that one more, one more time again. They have to have in church. She said, brother, tell him about your dream, Martin. And watch the video. He never gives the last paragraph of the speech. He, he pushes back and he looks up. And what you hear then is the greatest act of slam poetry in the history of the Republic. That's what you hear then. Art, poetry, genius, dare I say black genius, improvisational, not one of those words that your children be up here saying was written on the page. It wasn't written anywhere. It was written in the air. It was off the dome, as we say. Huh? Off the dome. And yet, here we stand 50 plus years later. I'm not good at math. There may be more than 50. Public schools. <laughs> and I was on CNN, sir. 50th anniversary. Presidents. You ever been to Washington, D.C.? They have a plaque, huh? On the ground where the brothers stood coming off the dome. A plaque. And 50 years later, presidents. Carter. Clinton. I believe W was there. It was all right. Everybody welcome that day. I don't remember if he's there or not. Anyway. Look at the video. Throwing elbows. Who can stand on the plaque? Who can stand on the plaque? Presidents. I was in Ferguson. And I saw something that haunts me to this day. And I, it haunts me mainly because we didn't put it on TV. But it's the point of my concluding remarks. I'm all for protest. Been to jail many times. All for demonstrations. But demonstration without legislation lead to frustration. And at some point, we've got to actually do something because when I was on the ground in Ferguson for CNN, right before they announced that they were not going to charge this uh, officer, and we can debate whether they should have or shouldn't have, or that's a whole different legal discussion. That's really not the, the point of this observation. I was outside on the streets. It was getting dark. It was getting darker. 300, 400, 500 young people out there. Probably about 1,000, 150, maybe 2,000 people, but 500 young people just like these young people you saw. They had a look in their eyes while they were waiting for the announcement. And it's the kind of thing I've never seen before. I hope I never see again. If you can imagine, I've tried to figure out a way to explain it to people. If you can imagine, this is a metaphor now, if you can imagine, see, I did learn things in my school. If you can imagine a city block when there's been a blackout, pretty dark. You can imagine a house on that dark street. 
completely black. But somewhere down in the basement, somebody lit a candle. How much light could you see from the street? Okay. Just that much light. That's how much light was still in the eyes of these young people. They didn't have a lot of hope. But it was a little bit. Just a little bit. And you could see it. And then the speakers came on. It's like they have speakers here. They had speakers all out in the street. And the DA comes out and he basically says, I'm not charging this officer. Now these young people have been marching and marching and marching and marching and marching for months. They marched when it was hot. They marched, I mean, and they also, they had passed an ordinance. You couldn't stay, stand still and hold a sign. So you had to march and march. If you stop, they'd arrest you. And they had appealed to the world. And they were waiting to see, not are you going to charge the officer, but does anybody care about me? Does anybody care about me? Does anybody understand what it's like to be in a city where more than half the people have been arrested, where the budget of the city depends on giving people tickets and fines and tickets and fines and tickets and fines, mostly black folk? Does anybody understand what it's like to see your friend, whether he's right or wrong, maybe he's a shoplifter, fine, but shot down dead in the street like a dog and left there for six hours? Does anybody, does anybody care about me? And I saw when that announcement came, the lights go out. In all those young people's eyes. What we didn't show on TV was big, tough men, 22, 18, 23, with tattoos and grills, hugging each other and crying like babies out there. We didn't show people just hanging on to each other and just walking away in droves and droves and droves. Just howling, crying. We didn't show that. We showed a few fools that went out and set some fires, and that became the whole global discussion. But I saw dreams die out there. I saw hope die in the eyes of young people out there. And nobody came... to give them a way forward and we expect them to figure out on their own. And then if they don't do it perfectly, then we want to criticize it. Well, what's Black Lives Matter a legislative program, you know? What's yours? You want these young people to fix 400 years of problems that we haven't fixed. And so I come to you to say that we have a tremendous opportunity to be at least as good as a 33-year-old kid getting coached by a 45-year-old sister with no cell phones, no Facebook, no Twitter, but the courage to dream again. And so I, I take it seriously, I invite you to, especially the young people, when a dictatorship goes into crisis, that's a good thing. It is a failure of domination. Huh? The, the armies and the, the spies and the security forces have failed to hold the people back. When a dictatorship goes into crisis, that's, that's a good thing. It's a failure of domination. But when a democracy goes into crisis, that's a failure of imagination. Huh? That's a failure of imagination, a failure of improvisation, a failure of innovation, a failure of the people huh? to co-author history with each other. And that's what's beginning to happen again now. And the work to which I'm committed and to which I call you is simply this. It's not very confusing if you're a young person standing on the streets of Ferguson. 
I was in Baltimore uh, with a, a rock star named Prince. I went back to Baltimore with a pop star named Alicia Keys. It's not very confusing when you're standing there. It's confusing in the academy. It's confusing in Washington, D.C. It's confusing with the policy elites. It's confusing in the state legislature. But when you're standing on the streets, the answer is very simple. We need to close prison doors and open doors of opportunity for the next generation. That's all. It's simple. It's not complicated at all. It's not complicated at all. And so there's a new movement rising. There's a new movement rising uh, to take on mass incarceration. Uh, we were enslaved. And that wasn't just bad for black people, that was bad for everybody, because even if you weren't a slave owner, you lived in an enslaving society, which meant you had to put up with the dehumanization of yourself or other people every single day. Don't forget now, under slavery, what that meant. You say, well, I wouldn't have owned a slave. Don't matter if you're white, if you don't own a slave. If a slave, an, 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 an enslaved African ran off, Huh? And another plantation owner shot that slave. You don't own either plantation, but you're white. You get called and, and paneled in a jury, not about murder, but to determine whether or not the taking of this plantation's property was a tort. Huh? You're a white juror. You don't own a slave. You don't approve of slavery, but you're a part of a society that will force you to vote on a jury. Well, uh, this man's property uh, got off his uh, land and this other person killed him and that was a taking of property. Does he owe him $100 or not? And you have to vote on that. Every single institution contaminated with a sick, twisted, despicable ideology that allowed the institution to exist. Slavery. Fought to get out of that. Jim Crow. Segregation. Well, I wouldn't have discriminated against anyone. Doesn't matter. You're in a society that if you sit on the bus next to Rosa Parks, you go to prison too. Doesn't matter if you try to open your store up and say, I want to serve everybody, the Klan will burn it to the ground. And you know that. So you rationalize. So we fought to deal with that. And now here's the third iteration, incarnation of the same dehumanizing ideology, not enslavement, not Jim Crow, but mass incarceration, the worst of both, huh? If you, if you, if you, you don't have to call somebody the N-word, you just call them a felon, huh? You don't have to call them the N-word. Call them a felon, they can't vote, they can't get a job. On the stock exchange today in your country, and you rationalize this, whack and hut, huh? Congressional Corporation of America, private for-profit prisons that go up in value every time somebody goes to jail. These are private corporations, young man, that are valued based on how many of your sisters and brothers are locked up. They have turned the Dow Jones into a high-tech uh, 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 slave auction in your country on your watch. And so we rationalize it. We rationalize it. Well. Uh, there are a lot of uh, drug dealers in the ghetto, you know, and, uh, you know, that, that's very, very bad, these uh, these drug dealers. And I'm sure that, uh, you know, if they had jobs, they probably wouldn't be drug dealers. But, um, you know, it's, it's bad and they're breaking the law. And, and if you break the law, you have to go to jail. It's the University of Chicago. 80% of the student body drug offenders.
I'm going to say it again. University of Chicago, Yale, where me and Derek went, 80% of the student body, drug offenders. Don't get upset, parents. Don't let me talk about your country club. Don't get upset, parents. Don't let me talk about your golf club, your yacht club. Huh? 80% of the student body on any of these campuses, drug offenders, and not one of them go to prison. Hmm? But we rationalize it. And so now, you see a movement rising. Now you see young people, 24 years old, 18 years old, starting to march again, huh? Starting to speak, sound just like Nikki Giovanni. You listen to these young women get on the microphone at these Black Lives Matter rallies. And not just Black Lives Matter. Don't forget, you got the dreamers coming on. Huh? Don't forget you got I don't know more out of the Native American community rising. The dreamers rising out of the Latino community. Don't forget you got 350.org, mostly young white climate activists rising. Don't forget you got, you just had Occupy Wall Street rising. You got a whole generation now starting to dream again. Starting to dream again. Nothing more precious in the world than young people with clear voices, young people with open hearts, young people who can imagine maybe if somebody on drugs, maybe they need to get some help. They can imagine maybe if somebody doesn't have a job and we're in the richest country in the history of the world, maybe we could just give them one. Start and imagine maybe if you have an idea in your mind you should be able not just to be a downloader with an app. Maybe you could be trained as a computer coder. You could also be a uploader too and be a part of this digital world. Maybe, maybe, maybe. I have no doubt in my mind, young people, that somebody in your row or somebody in your cell phone Somebody in your generation, and it might be you, probably is you, is going to decide to put your love against all this hate, put your hope against all this fear, put your poetry against these shackles, put your songs against this barbed wire, and if you do that, you're gonna win, and we're gonna win. You're gonna win, and we're gonna win. Thank you very much.